we can now talk about the kinds of equilibria that might emerge in markets with asymmetric information. And there are two extreme types of equilibria that could emerge. One in which no information has been revealed, and another in which all information has been revealed. The first we're going to call a pooling equilibrium, and the second we're going to call a separating equilibrium. Now if you're in a pooling equilibrium, no information has been revealed, so the full information asymmetry is maintained. Therefore, we have the full consequences of the adverse selection problem that we've been talking about. If all information has been revealed, it's been revealed through signals and screens. But of course, there could be many cases where we don't have all information revealed, but we only have some information revealed. So there could be equilibria that lie in between these, that have some of the characteristics of a pooling equilibrium and some of the characteristics of a separating equilibrium. Now let's make this a little bit more concrete by going back to our example of unemployment insurance. We've already talked about the adverse selection problem in the unemployment insurance market. We line people up from those who are at very low risk of losing their job to those who have a very high risk of losing their job. And we implicitly assumed that the insurance company has no idea who you are when you apply. They have no idea where you end up on this continuum. So no information has been revealed if we're in a pooling equilibrium, and so everybody gets treated equally. Everybody's offered the same premium for unemployment insurance. But that premium is going to be too high for those who have a really low risk of losing their job. So they're going to drop out of that insurance market. That's going to give rise to the adverse selection problem. Now we have an adverse selection of higher risk employees applying to insurance companies. And as they do, the premium has to rise. And as that premium rises, there'll be more low risk employees who will say, well, now it's not worth it to buy that unemployment insurance and they'll drop out of the market. And that can keep going. And in the extreme case, it could unravel the whole market so that no unemployment insurance ends up being sold in this pooling equilibrium. Of course, it doesn't have to be that extreme, but it could be. Now, what about a separating equilibrium? We can again line people up from low risk to high risk. But now, all information has been revealed. The insurance company knows exactly where on this continuum you lie when you apply for unemployment insurance. So now they can create separate prices for every different risk type. In other words, they're creating separate markets for the very low risk people, for these people, and so on and so forth. So lots of different markets emerge. Each has a different price that's targeted at the risk type that's applying for the insurance. Of course, the price for the low risk types is going to be really low. And the price is going to increase as your risk increases, with the highest risk people having the highest premiums. Now imagine that when this happens, no one actually wants to buy the insurance. Nobody thinks it's worth it. Well, in that case, the marginal benefit to the person who's applying is not equal, is in fact less, than the marginal cost that it takes to insure that person. When the marginal benefit is less than the marginal cost, we don't actually think it's efficient to provide a product. So in this case, we would say, it would actually be efficient for no insurance to be provided because nobody's willing to pay the price that covers the cost of insuring them. But there might be other motives for still wanting to have an unemployment insurance market. And those motives we call social insurance motives. Sometimes we want insurance just for efficiency reasons. But sometimes we also want certain types of insurance because we simply think that people have a right to certain kinds of products. Perhaps people have a certain right to have certain protection from the consequences of unemployment, even if the marginal benefit to them is less than the marginal cost of providing that insurance. In that case, we have social insurance motives 
and we might still want an insurance market for unemployment insurance in this case. The social insurance motive for offering insurance is particularly strong in the case of health insurance. We're going to spend a lot of time in class talking about health insurance and health insurance markets and the kinds of difficulties those markets run into. But one of the reasons that people think that we should have health insurance for everybody is that many people think that you have a right to health insurance. So that there's a social insurance motive for wanting to make sure that everybody has access to health insurance. Now, not everybody agrees with that, but many people have that social insurance motive for health insurance. So before class, I'd like you to think a little bit about health insurance and health insurance markets. What would a pooling equilibrium look like in the health insurance market? What would a fully separating equilibrium look like in a health insurance market? And you can go through the same steps that we just went through with unemployment insurance. Your pictures will look very similar. In the health insurance market that's a pooling equilibrium, we face the adverse selection problem. When we have full information being provided, we face the issue that health insurance premiums are going to rise the more risk you have of getting sick. So then you can ask yourself, what are the implications of the two types of equilibria in the health insurance market for those who need health insurance the most, for those who are relatively old and who are relatively sick? Will health insurance be affordable? And if it's not, why wouldn't it be affordable in the two types of equilibria? We'll start our discussion in class there.